Howdy friends, and welcome to another video. Today I'll be showing you the process of how I made this gorgeous dress. It's just something casual to keep in my closet, because who doesn't need a floor-length ball gown? Someone who is definitely getting kicked out of my all-the-clothes-that-you-never-ever-wear party is who that would be. This dress is primarily inspired by 50s evening wear, which often contained heavy-duty structure, and even had built-in girdles and corsets beneath the dresses in order to achieve those very fitted, wasp-waisted bodices. Before I even started on the bodice, I cut out three panels of my fabric to make sure I would definitely have enough left over for the bodice. I had five yards of this gorgeous printed cotton, which I used for another project before, and then sent a co-worker who lives near a different Joann's to go and get for me, because I wanted everything that they had left, and I wanted to make the most of it. I cut them into my actual panels later. For now, I just set them off to the side after measuring them each to be able to hit the floor, which I think was 43 for me, but I'm pretty short. As per usual, I drafted this pattern myself off screen since I already know this was going to be quite a long video. It's princess seamed at the front, but it's solid pieces at the back, and it is designed to sit very wide on the shoulder. I could have gotten an even more vintage looking silhouette with this if I'd had a bullet bra or even just one with a more vintage shape. I just don't own one of those yet. But it has a vintage feel with a wide set straps and a sweetheart neckline, nonetheless. With the bodice, I wanted to make sure that I didn't have any beheaded cranes or too close repeating of the pattern or weird print density problems, so the first thing I did was make absolute cabbage out of my remaining fabric. This was a very time consuming process to cut out all the pieces that I wanted for the outside of the bodice which I cut most of, but it turned out wonderfully, and nothing in the finished dress looks crowded or empty, or is obvious that the print repeats. I also cut an extra set from its remains for lining. I also cut the same pattern out of another fabric, a black twill.
for the structural layer of the bodice, and I cut the seam allowance down so that it wouldn't be bulky at the seams. I also should have just straight up not had it in straps, but it was too late by the time that I realized that. The structural layer is on the outside, but my bias tape boning channels are on the inside, between the lining and the twill fabric. This means that the bones won't be visible on the outside of the garment, so it'll look very smooth. You do pay for it in a slightly less comfortable garment to wear. This is why everyday corsets usually have boning channels on the outside, because then you're shielded by the actual structural fabric. And I hadn't really planned these boning channels out much. I knew I wanted some at the side seams, and maybe at the zipper, and then I was like, hmm, I should definitely have them to support the zipper on either side, and I'm debating doing lace-up anyway. And before I knew it, I was boning the front so it wouldn't fold up, though I didn't carry anything up through the chest region, which would already have support from a standard bra. I'm using synthetic whalebone in my channels, which is a different thing from the feather light boning that you usually see sold in craft stores, which is practically useless for any sort of genuinely structured garment. Synthetic whalebone is a different kind of polymer than the feather-like plastic and is meant to be able to be reshaped with heat and with moisture, so it works really well for historical garments like corsets, or things where you want a really smooth looking silhouette without it being super stiff like boning with steel wood.
start the actual assembly process. I started by pinning and sewing my front and side front panels together for both the outer layer and the lining, then clipping and pressing them, effectively turning the three front panels into one panel, then sewed up the shoulder straps front to back, leaving the sides open. I've used this method before in order to have a fully lined bodice without having to do that weird thing with the straps that the commercials tell you to do when you go and leave it open and then stitch it shut, but it doesn't make any sense and it's way more complicated than just doing up the side seams. Thank you. 
the two layers of quilting cotton would have managed this feat quite easily. Eventually, I did get everything turned out and pressed properly, and then it was time for the side seams. I pinned the side seams right side to right side on the lining, and right side to right side on the outer fabric, and stitched them up. This is where that couple of extra inches open in the armhole really comes in handy. It leaves you with just a little bit of room to be able to get all the way up to the front. Then you can sew the lining to the outside underneath without much difficulty, and it's pretty obvious where they should go. So the other side seams as French seams, but you take a detour around the pot. For anyone who doesn't know, a French seam is a style of seam where the fabric is first sewn wrong sides together, and the seam allowance is ironed and trimmed down and turned right sides together like a garment normally would be, encasing all those ugly wrought edges neatly in their own little tube. I sewed the pockets to the skirt wrong sides together, which will feel wrong, then right sides together, though I did stop for a moment to understitch and clip the corners, meaning I pressed the seam allowance to the, towards the pocket and stitched that down. This secures it to the inside, which means that this pocket is going to want to stay on the inside exactly where it should be if you're using a contrasting Material, it means that it is going to not be seen and stay exactly where it should be. Then I pinned and sewed the wrong sides of the skirt panel together with the pockets out and stitched that to a little detour from the side seams to go all the way around the pocket and turned and pressed to sew the right sides together, taking the same, the same detour all the way around that pocket again, securing everything in It's a difficult and finicky way to finish a dress and a skirt, but I really wanted this to be well constructed and not kind of slapdash together, even though this isn't a piece that's going to get a terribly large amount of wear. It makes me feel a little bit better to have it really nice on the inside, and it also meant that I got to figure out how to put my favorite finishing technique for skirts, French seams with pockets, which are essential.
my laborious French seam pockets done, I zoomed the top of all three panels through my sewing machine three times, staying within a half inch of the top on the widest possible stitch length. These are going to be my gathering stitches. You can also do these by hand, which I don't because it looks worse. But if your hand stitching is smaller and better than mine, it can look really nice. Or you can do it with two lines instead of three if you're feeling lazy. Or one if you're doing a mock up, but the finish isn't as nice. And the one strand has a risk of breaking. The skirt and bodice made one, the dress was nearly complete. It was time for the zipper. Normally I don't like using invisible zippers as I find them very difficult to zip up if you have more than one layer of cotton, especially if your seams are properly finished and not serged. But since this seam was at the center back, not in the side placket, in perfect view of all eyes, I decided that it would be worth the struggle. I ironed the teeth of the zipper flat, as you should with invisible ones, and then I installed this one the same way I normally do. I gently place the zipper where it should go, on the inside of the bodice, and then fold the sides over, accounting for seam allowance and roughly use that as a guide for what side goes against what, so I rarely have an issue with actually sewing my zippers in incorrectly. And then I used my invisible zipper foot, which I would actually recommend getting to actually install it. I did up the rest of the seam that the zipper gets stitched into, first with a plain seam just by machine, but I eventually did turn that in and whip stitched it down below the waistline since the top is covered by the bodice lining. It is at this point that I would really recommend that you try any project on, even if you made a mock-up for it. It's the last chance you have to correct any little eighth of an inch 
mistakes that you made before the lining is stitched down and then you have to rip it off to get the side, side front, and center back seams for any fit adjustments. Since I didn't have any fit adjustments to make, I went straight into the finishing. First, my flared seams caused visible dips where my panels met, so I smoothed that out by just measuring my desired hemline on the actual seams, since they were cut on an angle, and cutting off the extra that I didn't need, as it made for a smoother process hemming the skirt. Then I measured for my hemline. I measured an inch away from the bottom of the entire skirt, turned and pressed that fold to create a half inch turn and then measured two inches up from that fold which created a nice hem that I could tuck my horsehair braid into. Horsehair braid is a thin, flexible band, almost like ribbon, that easily stretches used for getting shape and volume to hemlines. Nowadays it's made of polyester, but it was originally made of horsehair, hairs from the mane or tail of a horse. If you've seen wedding dresses with a band that elegantly defines the edge of a netting gown's cascading skirt panels, that's horsehair braid. You can also use a stiffer fabric or an inner facing, which probably would have been better for me, but I didn't want to sacrifice any of mine for this project. You can also buy this in wider widths, but unfortunately none was available and none was in my stash at the time.
tuck the horsehair braid into the little pocket created by my hem and stitch it down by hand using whip stitches. I do have a blind hem on my sewing machine, but I wasn't sure how it was going to interact with the horsehair braid, but I also didn't want any visible pop stitching after all the work I'd already put into this thing, so whip stitching it was. The skirt had such a wide hemline that it took approximately an eternity, and I should have used the lilac thread that I used for basting on the hemline because I used dark blue for the hemline thinking that it would match the dark blue of the background, and those stitches are far more conspicuous than any of my basting stitches were before I ripped them out. Then the final step that you guys get to see. I stitched the lining in. Because whip stitches tend to catch in invisible zippers, I used slip stitches for the lining around them. Then I switched to a prick stitch for the waistline. I didn't have any particular reason for this, other than that I was sick of whip stitches after the hem, and slip stitching is by far my slowest stitch. If you've never heard of this stitch, it's similar to a back stitch, except instead of bringing your needle all the way to the visible part of your previous stitch, you bring it to only just before your new stitch. It feels quite secure and looks a bit interesting, so I can't say that I regret using it. Off camera, I pad stitched the whole thing quite thoroughly around the neckline to try and achieve something that hugged the top of the chest a little bit more, but it took so long and looked so incredibly imperceptible against the print hell backdrop of the lining that I didn't include it, but it did help. In the end, I wore this with a couple of heavily starched homemade petticoats and I'm quite pleased with it. It probably could have done with another panel of skirt to make the hemline wider for maximum dramatic spinning potential, but I didn't have enough fabric to do that and fussy cut out the bodice. Overall, it's beautifully finished and uses techniques that I'd never used before and is a grand and magnificent piece that will see almost no practical use in my wardrobe that used a dream fabric of mine that I went out of my way to procure, so I'm quite happy with it. Like this video if you liked this video. Consider subscribing if you want to see future less modern, although equally extra sewing endeavors. And hit that bell if you wish to actually be notified of them, because apparently the subscribe button does not do that. And join my Discord if you want to see even more stuff from me or show off your own artworks. Not just sewing, the Discord also has boards for art and 3D modeling and prop making and all those other creative hobbies. And I pop in to give updates, ask for opinions, and sometimes just post memes.
Give us a good twirl. Like a good spin. Towards the middle. There you go. Now, spin in the middle of the ballroom. All eyes on you. Gorgeous. Glamorous. Oh, there you go.